In 1941, a man would move from Krakow, Poland to Lviv and declare Ukraine independent for the second time in history. Already sentenced to death for a previous assassination, his declaration would lead him to prison, an ugly alliance with Nazis, and an early death by KGB agents, and possibly set in motion the Russo-Ukraine war of today. He is a man admired by many Ukrainians and hated by Russian President Vladimir Putin. But in order to understand who this man is, first, this is a rally of Ukrainian ultra-white nationalists marching the streets of Kiev in 2020. It looks scary and eerily similar to the American neo-Nazis in Charlottesville, Virginia. But these are not Americans. These are Ukrainians who live in the largest city in the country and its capital. Both groups look similar to each other because they share many overlapping views. Both idolize an ethno-nationalist state, where white men rule atop a throne of capitalism. They are virulently anti-Semitic, anti-communist, anti-woman, anti-gay, and anti-Russian. However, there are two important differences. The contingent of men who subscribe to this ideology is larger in Ukraine, and the man depicted here on the banner. The man on the banner is Stepan Bandeda, the Ukrainian man Vladimir Putin probably fears the most. And he is an extremely important figure for understanding Russia's justification for invading Ukraine. Although you may have never heard of Stepan Bandera, and Western media rarely mentions him, Vladimir Putin cannot stop talking about him. We see the Bandera supporters and neo-Nazis deploy heavy weapons, including multiple launch rocket systems. Moreover, they put these bastards like Bandera on a pedestal. They don't want communism? Fine. Who wants that today? They are throwing the founder of Ukraine, Lenin, off his pedestal. Okay, this is up to them. But they are putting Bandera up there. As today's heroes in Ukraine, the Holocaust means killing six million Jews, one and a half million of which were in Ukraine, and primarily at the hands of Bandera followers. Once again, I appeal to the Ukrainian soldiers. Do not allow neo-Nazis and Banderites to use your children, your wives, and the elderly as human shields. This is Bandera and his minions. These are the people who today are the heroes of Ukraine. You might be forgiven for thinking Vladimir Putin is calling Ukrainians bandits when he says Banderites, as I initially did. But he is not. He is referencing a very specific person and the lore around that man on purpose. So who is Stepan Bandera? And why does Putin keep talking about him? Bandera was born in 1909 in Stari Ruvni Galicia, a very important geographical region lying between current-day Poland and western Ukraine. And to many Eastern Europeans, Bandera is a polarizing man. For some, he is a Ukrainian freedom fighter and founding father. For others, he is a slimy, psychopathic Nazi collaborator. Depending on where someone grew up in the former Soviet bloc, they will have very different beliefs about this man. Because Bandera highlights not only the tensions between Ukraine and Russia, but also the tensions within Ukraine herself. Deep, dark tensions that Western media often brush over with a soft eraser. And it is not in Kiev, but all the way in far western Ukraine, in Lviv with Stepan Bandera, where we will understand Russia's narrative for invading Ukraine, and why so many older Russians may have mixed feelings about this war. Many Russians would be familiar with Galicia. Historically, it was a semi-autonomous region within the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Indeed, Galicia's capital was Lviv, and she bubbled like a cauldron for Kievan Rus nationalism against the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which ruled her during the 20th century's inception. But to show you how complicated this all is, here is a map of Europe in 1919 with briefly independent Ukraine and her borders east of Lviv. And then only four years later, Ukraine has now been gobbled up by the Soviet Union, and Lviv is in Poland. And it is during this rekindled Kievan Rus Ukrainian nationalism our man Stepan Bandero is born. From the jump, Stepan Bandero fought for proto Ukrainian independence using violence. This guy was no Martin Luther King Jr. I have a dream. No, no, he didn't have a dream. Well, he did, but it was not peaceful. At just age 25, Poland finds Bandero guilty of terrorism and sends him to death after he helps assassinate the Polish interior minister Bronislaw. However, before Poland can execute Bandera, he hits a stroke of luck. Nazi Germany invades Poland and frees him as they believe he can be a useful tool for fomenting political chaos through his followers in the Soviet Union like Lenin 20 years before him, and he is game to work with the Nazis. After the Nazis liberate Bandera, he moves to Krakow, Poland, which soon becomes an epicenter of Jewish slaughter and Polish genocide. 
and is from Nazi Krakow amid the Holocaust and then later back in Lviv, where he delivers the 1941 proclamation of the Ukrainian state, and pledges that Ukraine will work with Nazi Germany as she invades the Soviet Union on June 1941. And many Ukraine nationalist leaders celebrate, saying, we greet the victorious German army as deliverers from our enemy, we render our obedient homage to the government which has been erected. But the Declaration of Independence also takes the German authorities completely by surprise, as they see it as a coup attempt and want control over Ukraine's oil fields. So the Nazis enter Lviv and tell the Ukrainian government to disband, but Bandera refuses, so they arrest him. And this goes well for all of about two years until the remaining Soviet Union get their act together and start to aggressively push back the Nazis. So the Germans quickly free him again in 1944, and in exchange he agrees to rally his Ukrainian followers to help the retreating Nazis fight the Soviet advance. But Bandera, his followers, and Nazi Germany fail to stop the Soviet army, so Bandera flees Ukraine to western Germany. But from Germany, he never stops promoting his belief in an independent Ukraine. He continues to agitate against Russian dominance until a KGB agent assassinates him in Munich in 1959. And today, Bandera remains a highly controversial figure in Ukraine. Many Ukrainians hail him as their founding father, while other Ukrainians, particularly in the south and east, condemn him as a fascist Nazi collaborator who was, together with his followers, responsible for the massacres of Polish and Jewish civilians during World War II. Я думаю, що це логічно, тому що московський проспект веде в нікуди, а проспект Бандери веде до свободи. So why is Bandera so important? Because just 13 years ago, on January 2010, the president of Ukraine, Viktor Yushchenko, awarded Bandera the title Hero of Ukraine. But one year later, the award was annulled, after backlash from anti-Bandera Ukrainians. This shows how even Ukraine grapples with his image. And we should be careful not to project our Western idea of civic politics onto Ukraine. This has nothing to do with anything, but Ukraine literally threw one of their politicians in the trash bin, which I think redefines the phrase real politic. On a vetting law, an anti-corruption, uh, it's called lustration law, which uh, they put these, uh, these bins outside of the parliament for this particular reason, or symbolically saying that they needed to throw politicians into the trash. In this case, they actually uh, did that to one, in, one politician in particular. But Nonetheless, a certain contingent of Ukraine's love for Bandera or his legacy never left. Which brings us back to this rally of ultra-nationalist Ukrainians marching down Kyiv, holding images of Bandera just three years ago in 2020. These factions within Ukraine are not new. The political party Svoboda, members of who you see in this video, permeate throughout Ukraine. For example, this was their party flag until 2004. Not exactly subtle about their ideologies. And as recently as 2012, the European Parliament expressed concern regarding Savolda's growing support, recalling that, quote, racist, anti-Semitic, and xenophobic views go against the EU's fundamental values and principles. This is what Putin and his regime means when they say Ukraine is run by Benderas and Nazis, the very ideologies Russians fought against in World War II. And this message resonates loudly with many older generations of Russians. The head of Ukraine's state TV company has been attacked and forced to resign by at least three MPs from the far-right Svoboda party. They barged their way into the offices of Olysandra Pantelimonov, accusing him of serving Putin and being Moscow trash. Ironically, the man with the ponytail is the deputy head of Ukraine's Committee on Freedom of Speech. For many Russians, Bendero was a turncoat, a Benedict Arnold or Quisling, a man who sold out and condemned to death thousands of innocent people for the sake of an ideology. None of this justifies Russia invading Ukraine to annex her territory for her own national, economic, and demographic benefit. But when we understand the history Putin uses to communicate his war message, we can understand why many Russians feel ambivalent or have mixed emotions about the invasion, especially when Ukraine is building statues of Bendera. <laughs> Ukraine is a democracy, period, and a democracy's sovereignty must be respected. But a dark secret Western media isn't telling you is that Ukraine also holds deep ethno-nationalistic instincts. They would make even the most far-right Americans or Western Europeans uncomfortable. The Ukrainian Putin fears and hates the most is not Zelensky, it's Stepan Bandera. Because Bandera illustrates how Ukraine places her struggle for independence against both Russians and Germans in the pages of history. But the celebration of Bandera also represents how Russians believe Ukraine 
is willing to betray their common ancestral brotherhood to be what the Russians feel is a pawn for Western European hegemony. The problem for Putin is Bendera is now more than just a man. He has transformed into an idea. The idea of Ukrainian independence. And nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come.